John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. And God's word tells us this. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Galatah. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. We can stop. Heavenly Father, Lord, may your word be our delight. Let us praise you for all the truths we discover in your word. Help us to listen to the voice of the Spirit. Refresh us as we meditate on the wonders of your word. As we ask and we pray, for the Lord's name, amen. So, this week's uh, text continues in Jesus' trial, and he's standing before Pilate here. So with that, I'm going to serve with another reminder again of why John wrote this gospel. And we find that answer in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of John's writing. In our text, we're looking today at a trial that's not really in compliance of the laws of that day. The trial of Jesus was without legal precedent. He was uh, fraudulently convicted by the courts of his day. And he was executed by crucifixion, even though his judge found him innocent. So that's something that maybe we'll cover at some other time, how fraudulent this whole thing was. But today, the irony of this whole account is who the judges are. The, the Jewish leaders, right? the Romans, Pilate, 
compare it. They're defective judges. They're sinful judges, and they're judging Jesus, the perfect judge, right? They're unknowingly judging their eventual judge. And so we see kind of four types of people in our text here who had a hand in Jesus' death. We say, first, the Jewish leaders, uh, they were those who claimed to be holy. They claimed to be friends of God, but they denied Jesus. And then we see the Romans. We see Pilate, for instance, in our text. He was a coward. He knows what's right, but he refuses to do it. And thirdly, we see the Roman soldiers. They're servants of violence, right? In comparison to the servants of Jesus that we see, who operate in love for their enemies. And then we see ourselves here also. We, we ourselves participated in his crucifixion by being born in sin. That's the reason Jesus is on the cross, right? So our text here, it really brings to life the scripture of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. And it says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and a foolishness to Gentiles. We see that right here in our text, all summed up in that one scripture. So last week we heard Jesus ask, Pilate asked Jesus a question. We saw that back in uh, chapter 18, verse 33. It said, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? This week, we see a second question from Pilate in verse 9 of our text. Where do you come from? This was a reasonable question for Pilate, right? He's a pagan. He says, where did he come from? He says that because the Romans and the Greeks at that time had a multitude of gods who appeared here on earth in human form. Okay, that was their belief. And we can see that cultural belief when we read the book of Acts. It said in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 through 13, it gives us a demonstration of that. It says, in Listerine, there was a man who had red breath. I'm joking. <laughs> in Lystra, <laughs> I, I kept saying it in my head. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was outside the city, bought bulls and wreaths to the city gates, because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So that's the belief that Pilate operates underneath. Now, keep what we just read in mind, uh, and keep in mind what we uh, what Jesus said in chapter 18, in verses 36 and 37 last week. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now couple that again with what we read in verse 7 of our text today. The Jewish leaders insisted we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Okay? All that put together. Pilate's fear was being elevated in this account because when he heard Jesus' response back in chapter 18, 
and remembered what the Jewish leaders were claiming in verse 17 that we just read, it put that thought in his head, hey, maybe this is a God in human form, okay? Now let's add on to this again by introducing Matthew chapter 17, verse 19, the information in there. It says, when Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. For I have suffered a great deal today in, in a dream because of him. So Pilate may have, I don't know, he may have had all this going on in his head, right? And these red plagues are causing him to fear what was happening right here in front of him. He's being dragged into a situation he didn't really want anything to do with. Pilate was a coward, right, in the end here. But we do see him trying to attempt to get Jesus released from this trial. He even went so far as to offer up Barabbas as an exchange. And then in verse 9 of our text, we read this. And he went back inside the palace. He said, well, where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Jesus wasn't answering Pilate because we read in last week, again, chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. It says, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, my king is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus already answered Pilate's second question. Where are you from? Right here in verse 18, right? Last week. When asked, are you the king of the Jews? He already answered that. Jesus wasn't answering Pilate because Pilate never understood the first answer, right? To, are you the king of the Jews? It's just a basic principle, a basic spiritual, a spiritual principle, right? Which means God's not going to reveal anything new to you if we fail to act on the truth we already know, okay? So we have no new truths or depth added to our faith if we fail to do what he already instructed us. So for us, it means abiding in Christ, right? We've been through that many times in the past, reading about that in John. Abiding in Christ means maintaining our first love for him, then enabling us to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and be in the will of God. So as you continue to walk in the Spirit, He guides you with making decisions in life. The moment-by-moment -moment decisions and the actions of your life. So, But if we disregard those things that we're instructed, that we know we should be doing, we're not growing spiritually. There's no spiritual growth then. There's no new revelation of truth being learned through the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, 13, we read this. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So the key to knowing God's will is to be obedient to the guidance of the Holy 
the spirit, right? Of truth. So if you're willing to trust and obey God and live a holy life, God reveals himself to you. He directs your steps as a way of life, right? So Pilate had no understanding of what Jesus had just told him in the first place. Pilate had no real desire to know the truth. And for that reason, Jesus is not answering anymore. This is what it meant in Matthew when you read in chapter 7, verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. This is a very important principle for us as believers to understand that. Because it can be difficult at times for us to know when to speak and when not to speak. There are people that are so hardened to the truth that to give it to them only adds fuel to their fire, right? For their unbelief. And this goes along with what Jesus said to the disciples when he sent them out to preach. He said in Luke chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. Meaning, if their message was rejected, they were to shake off the dust and keep going until they found ears that were eager enough to hear the gospel. Jesus never pursued, he never begged people to follow him. He only invited them. Those with the ears to hear, we're going to hear. And those who will not, they've already been blinded. But we should also, what, pray for them, love them. But it's okay to look for other places to cast your pearls and cast your seed. So it really releases us from the responsibility of unbelievers in our lives. Have you prayed for them? Have you given them the word? If it's being rejected, that responsibility is no longer on you. As disciples of Jesus, we're responsible to everyone with how we live, now how we proclaim the truth, but only God is responsible for them. Let me come right down to it. It's enough that the person has heard the gospel and understands the choice that they make to oppose it. So, Jesus answers no more. If you remember last week in a text, and we're going to read it again, you know, it's kind of repetitive, but in verses 37 38 of chapter 18, he said, You are a king, then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came to the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And this is last week's big question. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. When Pilate stated, what is the truth? He turned and he walked away from truth. Pilate made it very clear at that time he had no real desire to know spiritual truth. Pilate had one real main interest, and that was to maintain peace in Jerusalem. Look at verse 10 of our text. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Here's the, here's the funny part. Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or crucify you? Pilate was fearful, and he had some anger issues going on here. 
Because every rabbit he tried to pull out of his hat was failing. Now Pilate resorts to his position of authority, the ability to set him free or kill him. Pilate was ignorantly boastful here, isn't he? He had no power to set Jesus free. Or he didn't even have the power to crucify Jesus. If he had the power to do either one of these, why didn't he? Jesus then replies to this false power Pilate believes he has over Jesus in verse 11. Jesus answered, you have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. God the Father placed and places all authorities in place. Whether you like Trump or Biden, good leadership, bad leadership, God places them there. Authorities in place because God permitted it. Jesus had no fear of Pilate. Jesus had no trust in Pilate's false power. His trust was in his father. Jesus didn't even need to make a deal in order to live. When Jesus was physically attacked, he was beaten, he was tortured, and then he was crucified, he refused to even threaten those who were hurting him. Instead, we see Jesus exercising this great self-control. He didn't retaliate, he didn't insult, he didn't threaten them, even with the coming judgment of God. So how did he do this? It wasn't just self-control. Jesus was trusting in God, his Father, to be the perfect judge at the perfect time. He trusted his Father. He trusted his Father would vindicate him. He would execute justice and he provided all that was needed and answered. So this allowed Jesus to be free to fulfill his purpose and not pursue justice for himself. Romans chapter 13 verse 1 says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That's what Jesus is doing here. And he's telling Pilate all authority is from God. That's why Jesus was able to surrender to this human government system because he submitted to his father. That's his strength. His father gave him the courage and the strength in order to do that submission to Pilate. Look at verse 11. It says, Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of greater sin. Who is Jesus talking about here? Who was guilty of greater sin than Pilate? Well, he's talking about in the Cephas that he was a High priest is who Jesus is referring to. To see if this knew what the scripture said. I lost my place. <laughs> Hold on. Lost my outline. Scripture comes up. Okay, so I'm sorry about that. So Jesus is talking about Cephas. He's a high priest. He's, he's corrupt. 
Cephas, like I said, he knew what the scriptures said prophecies, right? So he had no excuse. But Pilate, Pilate's a pagan with no scripture even. Now, back in, in chapter 11 of John, Cephas was already gunning for Jesus, right? Here's what we read back then in chapter 11. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called the meeting of the Sanhedrin what are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Cephas, who was the high priest that here, spoke up. You know nothing at all. If you do not realize it is better for you that one man die for the people than whole nation perish. He did not say the son of own, but as high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also the scattered children of God to bring them together to make them one. So from that day on they plotted to take his life. Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Cephas was the high priest. Pilate was just some regular old Roman pagan. That's why Jesus said, Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of greater sin. Look at verse 12 of our text. It says, From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. This is evil working against evil. Pilate was trying to release Jesus, and every avenue he tried was shut down. And finally, the Jews yelled, If you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. They hit Pilate pretty hard with this statement. They questioned Pilate's loyalty to Caesar. Then this is what this is when Pilate finally he gives in, right? He gives up. The Matthew tells us this. In chapter 27. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere that instead an uproar was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. Pilate tried to wash his hands of his responsibility of rejecting Jesus Christ. Yet he couldn't do it. He could not avoid this responsibility. And his guilt, we still forever recall, if you ever remember the Apostles' Creed, right? It said, I believe in God, the Father and Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his own Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead. No amount of water, no amount of soap, no amount of bleach would ever clean Pilate's pagan hands without forgiveness, right? Acts chapter 2 verse 23 says, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him. In our text today, we see that both the nation of Israel and the Roman government were really on trial here. It wasn't Jesus. With that, let's pray. Lord, we have we have words of eternal life. 
We adore you, we praise you, we beseech you, and we thank you so much for the gift of your sacred. 